Welcome to our fifth uh, lecture on uh, the biblical evangelist. Uh, evangelism in, in the New Testament is the emphasis of this uh, lecture, uh, building off what we have done uh, previously. And uh, the key verse that we come to in the first chapter of the book of Matthew is Matthew 1, 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So this cannot be a clearer definition of uh, uh, the person and work of Jesus. Jesus who is a descendant of David, as you read the genealogy. Uh, also, uh, Jesus, uh, the Son of God, born of a virgin. And this is the story of the first chapter of the New Testament. He will save his people from their sins. His very name is equivalent uh, to Joshua, the uh, Greek Jesus or Aramaic Jesus and the Hebrew Joshua, Yahweh saves. And building off of what we studied in Exodus 3 and emphasizing throughout our uh, lectures on the Old Testament, Yahweh, the personal name of God, the eternal I am who has become, he is what we need. He is a personal God, a delivering God, a patient God, a loving God. Uh, not wanting any to perish, not even wanting the Ninevites to perish in all their evilness and rebellion. And salvation came to them through the pro proclaiming, uh, the proclamation that came by Jonah, the reluctant uh, uh, prophet. God wants to deliver and save people. And we know that we're to be saved from our sins because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Genesis 3 is a big explanation point and illustration and explanation of the results of sin. Separation from ourselves, from God, from one another, and ultimately from our own bodies. And we could say that these are all forms of death. Uh, we are dying and we shall die, according to Genesis 2.17. The day you eat of this fruit, you shall begin dying. And that happens to all people. And so God's been on a rescue mission since Genesis 3, uh, 15. The seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. And Genesis 3, 21, uh, God provided uh, clothing from animal skins. Blood was shed. The man could be clothed and the guilt and shame could be covered. And man could live and rule with God even in a limited form compared to what the original promise and hope was. But God is on a rescue mission. And now in uh, uh, Matthew 1, we have the revelation of the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And uh, this is the purpose in Luke 19. Jesus came, said, I came to seek and to save the lost. So there uh, is a specific mission that Jesus was on. And it's a mission of salvation. In Luke chapter 4, we, we find a description and a sense of that mission, but also in a sense of, uh, of how Jesus will do this. Luke chapter 4, uh, verse 18 and 19, <clears throat> beginning uh, his public ministry in Nazareth, as Jesus took the scroll <clears throat> uh, of the prophet Isaiah, was handed to him. And he read from Isaiah 61 these words in reference to himself. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim uh, freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So uh, there's many elements in, in uh, the, these prophecies as Jesus uh, applies that to himself that we need to note. As we're thinking of a biblical theology of evangelism, what are these words, these prophecies, these scriptures telling us? Well, first of all, is that uh, the good news is something that's proclaimed. And that word 
is a word that emphasizes public announcement or declaration. Uh, it could be applied in, in a sense, I think, of a public billboard writing a message that all could see as they drive down the freeway. It could be a public address system at a stadium, in an auditorium, where a message is being declared. It could be a public declaration from the street corners or in a public park where uh, someone is uh, sharing a message. We call it preaching, but the idea of proclamation is public, not private. Uh, it is announced uh, to the world, to the community, not uh, necessarily to just the believing community. In fact, that's a, a wrong application of proclamation. The scriptures emphasize we teach the church as we gather, we proclaim the good news as we live in the world. Jesus emphasizes here public proclamation of good news, the message of the gospel. And of course, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. And again, Jesus does, does not do this just as God the Son who is incarnate as Jesus the Christ. He does that because the Spirit of God is upon him. Uh, the Spirit is working, uh, empowering Jesus Christ. He is with Christ. Christ is not alone. His communion with the Father, but the, specifically it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. So as we think of a theology of evangelism, here are two key elements that we cannot forget and we must take note of. First of all, evangelism is public proclamation, announcing, speaking, uh, a message that can be read, can be understood, uh, communicating a message. And secondly, that the Spirit of the Lord is involved in this. It's not just of Jesus Christ or of any believer, but uh, we need to be Spirit-filled believers just as Christ was uh, spirit uh, filled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse, uh, second part of verse 18, he was sent to proclaim. Another key element here in evangelism is uh, the sending, God sending. God sending Jonah. Uh, God sending, as it were, the Queen of Sheba to Solomon. Uh, in this case, uh, she, she is the unbeliever who became a believer. But there is in the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Or we could accurately translate it, as you go in life, be making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So evangelism has an intentional action. It's not an accident. It, it, it is... The compelled by God, it's in obedience to the word of God that we who follow Christ take the initiative to proclaim a message in the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, there's also the benefits of this proclamation that outlined for us uh, the problem that in a sense we're addressing with the gospel, the problem of sin and death. What does the gospel bring to people what they don't have. They, they need freedom because they're prisoners. They need sight because they are blind. They need to be set free because they're oppressed. And when these things happen, uh, they are enjoying the favor of the Lord. Uh, the favor of the Lord is freeing prisoners, giving sight to the blind, and those who are oppressed, not just prisoners, they're oppressed by something. They're oppressed by the evil one. In another way, these same ideas and truths are communicated to Paul. We'll study it in detail in Acts 26. When Jesus appeared to the apostle Paul, he, he told them, I am sending you, again, going, taking the initiative, an action, a plan, a strategy. And, he's, and what was Paul to do? He says, Jesus said, I'm sending you to open blind eyes, which it says here, uh, recovery of sight for the blind. I'm sending you to open the eyes of the blind, to turn them from darkness to light, 
uh, from the power of Satan to God. So at least two of these ideas here are carried out in what Paul has received. One, receiving sight. And second, uh, escaping the oppression of the evil one. And so uh, what Jesus did, he commanded Paul to do. And uh, this is his, you know, Jesus, in a sense, commission or announcement of his, why was he here on earth? I came to seek and to save the lost. And so as we think of a theology of evangelism from Old to New Testament, there are some very key uh, principles here that I have highlighted and that we need to note. And we need to note about Jesus who is the Savior, who is the Messiah, who came to seek and to save the lost. This was prophesied of his ministry by Isaiah the prophet uh, centuries before he came. But it's articulated in in Jesus really coming out into public ministry from private life into public ministry. This was his mission. His mission, proclaiming good news, uh, proclaiming freedom, recovery of sight, uh, the oppressed set free. And, oh, uh, just as I think of that, I think of all the oppressed in uh, American culture today, uh, the oppression of uh, addictions, uh, the oppression of uh, fear. So many people live in fear today, uh, fear of uh, economics, fear of uh, other people, uh, fear of uh, sickness, disease, uh, people live in all kind of oppression and they need to be set free. And this is Jesus' mission. Uh, so these are introductory thoughts. The name, and again, the name of Jesus, Jehovah saves, Yahweh saves, um, is, uh, as we know, biblically, the name is uh, a description, a definition of the person. So when we have a name in the Bible, and uh, in, in Jesus' name, it's very important because it tells us of their nature and of their mission, their purpose in life. And uh, his purpose was to, to be a, a savior. And that was very clear from the beginning. Uh, in Luke chapter 15, uh, we have some uh, tremendous insights into uh, the call and the work of uh, evangelism, principles of uh, the lost. As we said in, uh, earlier in, in Luke 19, Jesus, uh, 1916, Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. So who are the lost? What, what do we learn in Scripture uh, about the lost and about uh, the ministry, I would say, of evangelism in reaching the lost? And uh, Jesus tells three parables that are very, very um, uh, profound. Uh, these uh, need to be studied and uh, not just memorized, but practiced by every evangelist and really every disciple um, uh, because it's the focus of, uh, uh, in a sense, evangelism and, and, and key principles uh, from the heart of God and should be from our heart and uh, so Jesus uh, was uh, with some tax collectors and sinners, it says in Luke 15, 1. Now the tax collectors and, and sinners had gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This uh, man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So uh, in order to save the lost, Jesus uh, ate and associated with sinners. He was with them. In fact, it says he welcomed them. He welcomed sinners. So right off the bat, we have this principle of we who are saved or who know the Lord, uh, do we have sinners as friends? <laughs> do we associate with sinners? Uh, the people who don't know, the unbelievers. Um, we're not to live in just uh, a holy huddle of Christians. Uh, Jesus himself was out among and living with, eating with, fellowshipping with, dialoguing with the sinners. And uh, Jesus told them this parable. So we have for Jesus in the biblical context, he's with sinners and with Pharisees. There's a mixed group here that he's teaching. And uh, uh, Jesus said, first of all, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and uh, loses one of them. 
Doesn't he leave the ninety of nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So again, the focus is clear. The focus isn't on the 99. The focus is on the one. And very simply, as a principle, we should write down uh, the, the principle, one matters. One person matters to God. Another way to say it, every person matters to God. In this case, the story is about being lost, wandering away, just as we read in Isaiah. All we like sheep have gone astray. All of us have tendencies. The, the nature of man, whether in a passive and quiet way or a rebellious way, is the, the, uh, the, the, the movement of our life is away from God, not toward God. And uh, so here we have the, the one lost sheep. Whether in ignorance or in rebellion, it, it gets lost. And it's interesting that it notes that this herd of sheep uh, are in the open country. They're not in a pen. They're out in the, the hill, hillside, uh, out in the pasture, out in a place where in one sense they're always in danger because it's open country. But the shepherd uh, leaves the 99 that are together and he goes to find the one. He goes to seek the one. I've often thought in my uh, memory of the number of uh, people I know, in this case older men, my dad being one, uh, another man when I was growing up in our church uh, who was uh, a noted sinner but a wealthy successful guy who came to the Lord. And uh, both of those individuals that impacted my life significantly came to the Lord because one person, and in this case, both of the, in both cases, it was a relative. For my dad, it was, his, well, in both cases, it was a brother-in-law. <laughs> my dad's brother-in-law and, and uh, uh, this gentleman's brother-in-law who happened to be my Sunday school teacher. But they, they were one-on-one -on -one guys. They weren't mass evangelists. They, they were uh, laymen, uh, as we would say, but uh, they, they brought the gospel and uh, God used them to clearly explain and to be used of God to pray with and, and uh, bring these people into the family of God to uh, be being born again. Uh, it was one-on-one, one-on-one, -on -one, one -on -one. and uh, I think this happens far more than we understand. And, um, but this parable, the first one in Luke 15, one soul matters. And the chief shepherd, the, the main guy here, the shepherd, went to find the one. One lost soul in this, in this parable is more important than the 99 who are saved. And it reminds us in this life and where we are now in this life, that God is very concerned the lost are saved. The one who is out there by themselves, vulnerable defenseless from the uh, attacks of the evil one, that they're rescued and, and brought into the family of God. It ends with uh, the uh, more rejoicing. I tell you in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to, be re to repent because they've already repented. <laughs> they, they're already righteous. They've been brought into the fold. So Luke 15, as we think of the theology of evangelism, one life matters. The, the importance to us as disciples, as evangelists, that this work of evangelism in God's eyes is extremely important and uh, we should value it also. The next parable in verse 8, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins, loses one, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. 
In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Um, so this, again, is a short parable, and it's about coins, which uh, many uh, scholars suggest this is kind of her dow dowry. It's kind of her uh, Social Security uh, fund, uh, her inheritance, uh, what she would live on as a, an older uh, woman, maybe an older a single woman, and uh, she loses one. Uh, she had ten, she lost one. So a tenth of her wealth, in one sense, if we want to look at it that way, she, she lost a tenth of her wealth. And uh, she uh, uh, stops what she's doing and uh, uh, lights a lamp, sweeps the house, and searches carefully until she finds it. So um, I don't think the emphasis here is like on the lost sheep. It's about the lost sheep, or here in this case about the lost coin. I think this parable is very much about the woman and what she does to find the lost coin. She has nine, and, but she's lost a tenth of her wealth. So if any of us lost a tenth of our wealth, that would be devastating, really. <laughs> maybe change the way we live or don't live. And so this is extremely important, and she understands that. And I like to note at, at this kind of in a humorous way uh, that in order to do what she did, uh, light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully, she had to stop whatever she was doing. She had to make this the priority of her life. For this moment, until this this coin is found. This is the priority. This must be done. And second, it takes effort. She not had to stop what she's doing. She, she had to get a lamp. She had to get proper lighting. She had, to get, uh, she had to search and search and sweep and look in every nick and corner or wherever it was until she found it. And she persisted. She persisted until she found it. So right there in itself, in terms of evangelism, in terms of finding the lost, uh, boy, there's some really key parable, uh, uh, principles. One is it a priority of our life. And in this case, it's the priority. It's number one. So could any of us say, or we as evangelists, how do we make this the priority of our life? To find the lost, seek the lost. That's what the parable is about. And about a lot of effort, work, uh, getting a lamp, uh, searching, sweeping, moving furniture, uh, looking here high and low, <laughs> and persisting until it's found. And uh, one story in honor of my dad, uh, his next older brother, my dad was the youngest of nine, and uh, the next older sibling was uh, a brother, a brother who we might say was uh, the odd man out, the black sheep of the family, uh, a man who was a, an alcoholic, a man who um, caused great harm to his family, to his children, um, a man who was a sinner and addicted uh, to alcohol. But my father and mother really persisted over decades of trying to reach my uncle and his family for Christ. And they did many uh, benevolent and kind things uh, putting food on their table, taking care of their children, uh, bailing my uncle out of jail, taking care of his family while they were in jail. And as a child, I, I didn't really know all this was going on. Later, I understood these things. Um, but uh, my, my dad and my uncle grew old, and then literally the, the last year of their lives or years, in the last few months, actually, of my uncle's life, um, the, uh, gov the state where he lived, uh, the family, his family uh, put him under the control of the state, became a ward of the state. And uh, just so happened that the state government put him in the same city in custody or in a basically a home. It wasn't a, a criminal in that sense, but... He was in a home, a care home, because he couldn't take care of himself. He was so 
feeble and an invalid, but in the same city as my father, which didn't have to be the case, but it's what they did. And my dad, who had shared the gospel, I don't know how many times, in word and prayers and for 51 years, from the time of my dad's conversion, 51 years later, his brother came to faith in Christ through, again, the, the preaching, the sharing of the gospel of my dad. This woman persisted until she found it. And uh, that certainly is one of the teachings here about we as witnesses, as evangelists, that we must persist to the end as long as we can until uh, we find those who are lost. So Luke 15 is a tremendous uh, passage of scripture for evangelists. Uh, the first parable, one soul and every soul matters. There isn't a soul that doesn't matter, but one matters. And we can't get focused just on the big numbers or the masses or everything. Uh, we need to individually ask the question, who is our one? Who is the one, the two, the three that God has put in my life that I need to be sharing the gospel with? Second is we persist. We persist until the end. After my, my uh, uncle came to faith through my dad's persistence and preaching and praying, um, uh, my dad's health uh, failed. And uh, I don't know if it was a year, year and a half within that time, he also died and went to heaven. But uh, I'm sure that he was glad when he got there. He got to see his brother, who had also simply by faith called on the Lord Jesus Christ to save him and deliver him from sin and eternal death. There's a third parable. And again, for evangelist and uh, thinking of a theology of evangelism, uh, this is another uh, very famous story and very profound uh, parable. There are many, many lessons here, and uh, we could have a whole course probably just on Luke 15. But the third parable that Jesus told, and again, who was his audience? Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So again, Jesus is speaking, speaking to, a, in a sense, a mixed audience, tax collectors and sinners and then the religious people. But all of those people are, are lost. <laughs> all of those people need a Savior, whether they're religious or irreligious. And this is Jesus' story to those who are lost. One life matters, and uh, we need to persist and focus on finding the lost, just as this woman did finding the coin. In verse 11, and Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Uh, we'll kind of divide the story up and, and look at this part. So this is a Jewish story, a Jewish father, two sons, and the younger son uh, with uh, pretty much his own bluntness and selfishness basically insults his dad and says, look, I, I want my inheritance. I want it now. We would say in America, uh, he would say, drop dead, dad. <laughs> Give me the money. The only thing that counts is the money. You don't count. I don't care about you. I don't care about your integrity, your honor. All I want is what's owed me. And uh, so the father here, obviously, uh, in a loving way, uh, didn't argue, it doesn't seem. He just gave the, the uh, proper inheritance to do his son 
financially anyway, and the son uh, had it a week or so and then took off. Took off to a far country, uh, we would say today party style, living it up, uh, spending wildly, doing whatever he wanted to do, uh, fun, uh, food, uh, games, uh, women, uh, and he wasted it all. He just he squandered his whole inheritance in a very short period of time. And then circumstances changed. There was a famine, there was shortage of everything, people were hurting, people were hungry, and he got a job as a Jewish boy feeding pigs. And there itself is uh, irony and, and judgment because pigs were not well honored, they were avoided by the Jewish people. You weren't eat, to eat pork because of its uncleanness. But here this young man had to feed them. And so he sent out to feed the pigs. And he was so hungry, he actually wanted to eat the pig's food. So this is uh, Jesus' story telling you that this young boy is the lowest of the low he could ever get. Uh, physically, uh, alienated, uh, alone in a far country, uh, groveling for whatever he could find to eat. This is a despised, rejected, uh, wasted life. And in that state, it says, when he came to his senses, that is the young boy, the youngest son, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. So this is in the story, the time of repentance, the time of honest confession to himself, uh, the time of enlightenment, as it were, or conviction out of need. He finally gained uh, some sanity that my life is wasted. I'm wasting away. I'm I'm going to die. This is terrible. I, I, something needs to change. And what needed to change, he admitted, I need to change. I need to go back to my father, confess, I am unworthy. Will you, in your mercy, take me back? And so this, uh, in, in terms of evangelism, and in, in terms of sharing good news, it's the point that people need to acknowledge that they are sinners and that uh, there is a Father who loves them, and there is a way back, and the way back is through humility and through confession and through uh, seeking the mercy of God. And when this son does this, which he does do in the story, we find out how the Father responds to him. And again, I believe in this parable, as we all know, and this is the beautiful thing of, of any story we could ever imagine, is the character who the Father is God. This is the God of the Bible. This is Jesus' Father. This is the Father that currently rules the universe, who created it, who will someday judge the universe. This parable is, is very clear and obvious that this is the God of the Bible. And he, in this parable of the father and the sons, uh, does amazing things, things that are way beyond the, the way that people were living in their culture. It says, but the, while he was still a long way off, that is the father, but while he was still a long way off, excuse me, but it's about the son. While the son was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him." So this is one of the most uh, beautiful, amazing, wonderful stories of love that has ever been imagined or told among mankind. There is a father, and he is God. And he created the world, and he loves mankind. It's the God that 
It said in the book of John, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. It's this, Father. Jesus was said, asked by his disciples, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray, our Father who art in heaven. It is this, the fa- this is the Father that's here in this story. And this Father is, first of all, looking for his Son. He's not forgotten his son. He's not passive. He's looking because it says his father saw him while he was a long way off. And uh, I could imagine in the American Old West, uh, father on the porch of the ranch house, looking off down the, the long trail or road to the far distance and looking for that time or the son that would someday, hopefully, come home. So noted in our theology of evangelism, the father is looking. His back isn't turned on the lost. He's looking for the lost son. And when he saw him, it says he was filled with compassion. Just as Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he looked on them with compassion. Compassion is a word that means I feel with my emotions are attached to my dreams, uh, my hopes. And when, when he saw the son, he wasn't angry. He was filled with compassion, with hope, with uh, the desire for reunion. And uh, thirdly, uh, the action of the father, he was not only looking and his heart was not only filled with compassion, but he ran to his son. Now this, as I understand it, is a cultural taboo. Older men in the ancient Near Eastern culture don't run, not because they couldn't run, but it was uh, uh, undignified. (laughs) They were to walk. They were to walk with their head up and dressed in robes and uh, have dignity and have others serve them and part the way as they came into the room because of their nobility, their dignity, the honor to do the older. And if you wanted something, someone went and got it for you. But in this case, he wanted his son so much that he ran. He picked up the skirt of that robe and he ran and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And uh, great emotion, affection, uh, welcoming him home, Uh, pouring out his heart, his love, uh, all the things that uh, he had missed. He had missed most of all his son. Great affection here. So verse uh, 20 is an amazing verse of, of God's love, God's patience, God's focus is on the lost. And uh, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. God is wanting everyone to come home, you know, male or female, whatever your ethnicity, your age, your economic status, your mental health, uh, your past history, it doesn't matter. God wants the rebellious, the young, the indifferent to come home because he's waiting. And this is the, the amazing truth of this parable. God is waiting, not passively, but he's looking. He's looking for those who want salvation, who want him. And those who want him are all welcomed. They're welcomed home. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Again, a note of uh, the repentant. They need to acknowledge. They need to humble themselves. They need to understand they are sinners. They are unworthy. We are all unworthy. There is no one worthy, not even one. But when you come home in humility, you're welcomed and you're loved and you're embraced by the Father. But beyond that, it says, the Father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf, kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead. 
and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Um, this itself is uh, an amazing description of those who truly come into relationship with God the Father. They are welcomed. They're celebrated. If you've never felt celebrated in our gospel, we need to preach of people feel worthless and, and uh, unworthy um, as much as we can be. God believes in you. God loves you. And he shows it in this way. And the teaching here is very, very profound. Uh, it says, bring the best robe and put it on him. A robe, uh, I believe, stands for a whole new view of oneself, a whole new identity. Um, the scriptures talk about the robe of righteousness that uh, Jesus, uh, Paul says, the breastplate of righteousness. We are robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Uh, our garments, is, uh, uh, which were filthy rags, our sin and our failures, are all put away, and we're to view ourselves as God does. We are identified with his robe, a royal robe. I think of the story of uh, Joseph in the Old Testament. It had a, a colored robe, a unique, a magnificent robe that marked him out different from all his brothers. And this is uh, the identity we have, I believe, in Christ. We're new creations. We need to think different, feel different, act different, because we are different. We're born of the Spirit of God when we come to faith in Christ. And here is this picture. I want my son to feel, to think, to act differently because he's no longer that lost son. He's the son that has come home. He's my son. This robe is, is my robe in a sense. I made it. I made it for him. It's unique to him. It identifies him with the family, with me. And uh, I believe this is the robe of a new uh, relationship, a new identity that, that we have when a person who is lost is found. And put on their ring, uh, his, uh, put a ring on his finger. Ring on his finger, I believe, is a signature ring of authority. Again, no doubt it had a seal, a seal of the father, seal of the family. And when you want to buy anything, uh, he could use that as, in a sense, a debit card. Here's my authority. Here's the ring on my finger. The ring of the father has given to me. And when I speak, I speak with confidence, authority. Uh, power has given, not because of me, but because the father has put a ring on my finger and I Certainly, I'm identified with him, but also all his assets are, are in this ring. Uh, when I, I go to purchase something, when I go to sign a deed, when I go to make an agreement, I put my signature ring down, and it stands for who I am, and I'm part of the family of God, and part of God, and, and uh, I, I live with his authority. And finally, it says, and put sandals on his feet. Sandals uh, guard the feet as we go somewhere. It gives us direction, purpose. Paul said uh, our spiritual armor is the gospel, that we shod our feet, feet with the gospel of peace, that we do have purpose in life. We have a message from God. We have the word of God. We're living out the purposes of God in our life. And... Uh, to me, uh, these three things uh, are powerful, powerful uh, uh, symbols, as it were, of what it is to have a relationship with the Father. We are identified with Him. We live with His authority, and we carry out His purposes. And this is life. This is what Jesus said in John and another place, 11. I have come that you might have life, excuse me, John 10, and have it abundantly. And to top it all off, bring the fatted calf, kill it, and let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. 
uh, the life with Christ is, and the Father is a life of celebration, of hope, of laughter, of singing, of anticipation uh, of a, an eternity with God forever and ever. Bring the fatted calf, kill it, let's have a feast and celebrate. So the Father, amazingly, this is a picture of salvation. What happens when one comes home to the Father? Uh, he's, and he or she, they are anticipated. God's looking for you. God wants you. God desires to have a relationship with you. He wants you to come home. And when you come home, and uh, again, in the parable, those who come home are humble, admitting their sin, their lostness, their need. And uh, when they come home, they're welcomed, they're embraced, they're loved, and they're given uh, a new identity, uh, an everyday authority that gives them power and purpose, a purposeful life, a life uh, lived serving, worshiping uh, Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, it says, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he, is, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed you, your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours, but we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead, and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. So this final parable is really the parable not just of the prodigal son. It's the parable of the two sons. And it's told to a, a mixed audience of sinners and uh, tax collectors and religious people. And as the tax collectors and sinners would probably identify with the young son, the youngest, the, pro the, the prodigal, I'm sure the religious uh, people became rather uncomfortable when Jesus talked about the older son, who was obedient, who did not rebel, who lived in the father's house, but in many ways he didn't know the father. Um, he didn't understand uh, forgiveness. He didn't understand the great compassion. He was a person of duty and, and uh, meeting the quota and meeting the agenda and trying to, to please. And he was a behavioralist. And he felt by his own behavior, he would earn uh, the Father's love. He would earn uh, uh, access <laughs> to all that the Father had. When in fact the Father says, all I have is yours already. Why haven't you used it? You, you, you haven't had a goat, you could have a, a calf. You could have a cow. You could have a feast. You could have a party. Why not? Well, it's because the older son was not humble at all. He was proud. He was proud of what he did. He felt he should be obviously rewarded for what he did. Um, but the sad thing to me as I look at this parable is that the older son would not go into the house. He wouldn't go into the celebration. He wouldn't go in and, in a sense, enjoy the relationship with the father and his brother. He didn't want to forgive. He wanted uh, to be honored because he was obedient all the time. And he had done whatever had been told of him. There was no need of the father. There was no need of forgiveness. There was no need of compassion. There was no need of the love of the Father. He was independent. I'll stay out. I'll, I'll live life the way I want to live. I'll do what I want to do. And uh, I don't need the family. I don't need the Father. 
I don't need a, a brother. And so in, in this parable of the lost sons, um, it is a great contrast, but is also very insightful into who the lost and the saved are. In the first parable, uh, the one lost sheep is found and brought back by the master, the shepherd. In the second parable, the lost coin is found because of focus, persistence, and determination. In the final parable, the lost is found because the lost son, not a coin or a sheep, realize they're a sinner and they're separated and they're in death and they humble themselves and he comes home. And his homecoming is glorious <laughs> and he's welcomed. But the older son, at least in my perspective, is not found. He also is lost because he's unwilling. He's unwilling, in a sense, to humble himself, unwilling to forgive, unwilling to accept a father that is willing to forgive his son, his brother. He's not about forgiveness. He's about duty. He's about uh, trying to please or, or bring honor to himself, show how good he is. But uh, we know that we can never be good enough. The parable ends, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because your brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So the father pleads with the older, older son uh, to accept, to receive uh, the brother who is lost and is found. I think uh, the chief uh, t teaching of the parable, uh, well, I don't know if there's one, but there are several. One, what does it mean to be lost? Uh, secondly, and very profoundly, what is God the Father like? And what does he give as salvation? What does he impart to a son that is basically unworthy, but he's humbled himself? He seeks to be restored to the Father. He comes home to the Father. When you come home to the Father, this is what the Father will give you. A new identity, power and authority for life, purpose in living, and a life to celebrate. Celebrate with others. This is the gospel, and uh, this is the teaching of Luke 15, and very profound. So as we move forward as a class, as we move forward in our study of uh, theology of evangelism, Luke 15, I think, is very significant, uh, very uh, dramatic, very powerful, and we need to continue to reflect on the principles of evangelism we see here and uh, understanding the lost, understanding the Father, understanding what salvation really is, and also the warning that it gives to us of those who are filled with pride and will not humble themselves. So we've begun uh, our study in the New Testament as a broad overview of theology of evangelism with Jesus the Messiah, born in Bethlehem, uh, declared to be the Savior, Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, this is a message that's to proclaim. And the stories of Luke 15 illustrate for us the powerful good news of the grace of God as seen in the Father in the parable of the lost sons. Reflect on these things.